Welcome to episode 78 of the Scarlet Faithful Podcast. I'm your host and co-founder, Aaron Brightman, coming to you on Wednesday, May 24th. Getting through the week, hope everyone took a deep breath and got a good night's sleep after Tuesday with uh, a little bit of uh, panicking around the fan base. I tweeted this morning uh, a uh, gift of, the roller co- of a roller coaster. Uh, what it's like kind of been this off season for Rutgers fans. And um, obviously last uh, episode, I talked about all the reasons why you have to continue to take kind of things in stride and look at the big picture. And this episode is going to talk about Rutgers and basketball more, uh, even more so a uh, few updates. I uh, we'll, we'll want to discuss scheduling. want to discuss uh, my thoughts on Cliff Omori one week away from making a decision on staying in the NBA draft or returning to Rutgers. And, but I wanted to start with recruiting because credit to uh, the night report, uh, Richie Schneider, right? Mike Broadbent talking today, putting their future cast in Richie, uh, which is kind of like a crystal ball that they do at 24 seven sports, but just basically predicting that Dylan Harper is going to come to Rutgers. Um, I've talked about it all some, uh, off season, how it's trending in the right direction. He gave some really good kind of relationship connections on why he's so confident it's going to happen. So you should check them out, their latest podcast. And uh, I think, you know, obviously when one thing happens, as I talked about yesterday, you have to connect the dots. You have to look at the big picture. So, you know, I don't know for a fact, but when Delquan Warren says he's decommitting and it has nothing to do with NIL and he made a decision too early, think about the fact that he committed in January, right? Rutgers is always prioritizing Dylan Harper, but over the months, things have trended in the right direction, continue to trend in the right direction with Dylan Harper. So did that play a factor into Delquan Warren decommitting? It's possible. I said when Kurt Tang chose Michigan State over Rutgers, I thought that that was a factor there as well. Uh, so that's why you can't overreact to one thing. Uh, we'll see what happens. Um, every anything, indication that Dylan Harper's given is that he's waiting until after Peach Jam, which is, which is in July. It's already Memorial Day, so we're really not that far off. Early signing periods in November. You have Ace Bailey. You have Lathan Somerville. Obviously, they got Dylan Harper. That's two of the top four recruits in the entire 2024 recruiting class, which would be insane. And so let's just see how things play out. This has been a really, really up and down off season, but it's been made more up and down because of the emotional kind of swing that happens with news and we're all desperate for news. You know, we all love college basketball. We all love Rutgers men's basketball. So we're all fiending for any little piece of news that we can get. Uh, But this is obviously uh, for them to go out and say for Richie to say that he predicts he's going to go there, uh, that Dylan's going to come to Rutgers. Obviously that's, that's big. Um, And we'll see what happens. We'll see what happens, but uh, it has been trending positively for a while. Uh, Duke and Indiana seem to be the main threats. Uh, I really Duke, I would say, um, you know, and, uh, we'll see what happens, but obviously this ties into my point yesterday. NIL is a concern. NIL is important. NIL is not everything. And to just assume that Rutgers is dead in the water now and recruiting and holding roster, the roster together. It's just not true. So I'm glad that this kind of report came out today in terms of the confidence level that that Dylan Harper is going to go to Rutgers. We'll see what happens. But, um, you know, I've said for, for a a couple months now uh, on this podcast that I, I, things are definitely trending in the positive direction. And obviously this is just more kind of positive news uh, projecting that. So what that also does open up now with Warren not coming, although he is keeping Rutgers open. We'll see what happens. Like I said yesterday, typically they don't come back. It opens up another scholarship. So what is Rutgers going to do with that open scholarship? They could do a lot of things. You know, there, there's other targets in that class. Tyler Betsy is one. Nas Cunningham uh, has Rutgers in his top five. I'm honestly not really sure how hard Rutgers is recruiting Nas Cunningham, but that's a possibility. Tyler Betsy would be huge. And these are players in different skill sets, less repetitive with Dylan Harper. They would be obviously 
you know, and I, I don't know how much NIL plays into the, their their decisions, but from what I've read, it seems like it is a factor for them. So we'll see. But um, I'm more curious too. Also now with with Steve Peichel in the portal, looking for a guard, looking for a big man. We know that year to year rosters are going to change. I think that Steve Peichel is approaching it that way now. I think he's much more uh, he's adapted to the idea that. You have to approach it year to year. But, you know, a big reason he, he went after Cam Spencer last year is he had two years available. Obviously, it didn't work out that way. But I think that if there's a transfer out there that they're interested in, that they think is a fit, and that has two years left, that's something you can now do with Delquan Warren out of the picture for now. If you have Dylan Harper, East Bailey, and Lathan Somerville coming in, three highly rated freshmen. I do think it makes sense that, hey, maybe, you know, and of course, if you get a, a Betsy or Cunningham, I mean, those are big talents too. But I think it would make a lot of sense to, to add a veteran with them. You know, you're going to have Derek Simpson as a junior, Wolf as a junior, Moat Mag can potentially come back for his fifth year. You're going to have Gavin Griffiths becoming a sophomore. Antonio Chol. Hopefully he gets some run this year and gets some experience. But to Michael Davis, they're still going to be a relatively they're going, to, they're going to be a younger team. So if they could bring in a portal guy this year that has two years left that can integrate into the team this year and then be a veteran leader next year with those guys coming in. I mean, look at it. Look at it that way. That makes a lot of sense. That makes a lot of sense. So, it's. I look at that possibility as. You know, you, you never want to lose a recruit. You never want to lose a highly rated recruit. Delcon Warren, four star. I really like this game. Defensive first point guard. But if it ends up being that, where Dylan Harper comes and you get a veteran transfer portal guy that's going to be here for two years, and help move the culture forward. And be a leader on those teams with when, when that high, high elite yet young talent comes to the roster. I, th I think that's a net positive. I really do. So let's move on and talk about scheduling. It was announced officially just a little while ago. Uh, it did come out with John Ross team. Uh, I don't even know what day was that. Monday uh, at the Gavin case. I think it was Monday. I was potentially going to come out last week, uh, but that Rutgers is hosting Georgetown for the Gavit games. Rutgers officially announced it. Uh, the, the two conferences officially announced it here on Wednesday. And it's going to be November 15th. It's a Wednesday at the rack hosting Georgetown. So we know now in terms of high majors, Rutgers is going to be traveling to Seton Hall as part of the Garden State Hard Work Classic. Uh, we know they're going to travel to Wake Forest as part of a home and home series. Rutgers hosted Wake Forest last year, won by 24 points. They're going to travel to Winston-Salem this year. So that's two high major road games. And then you're going to host Georgetown. Uh, so those three high majors are on the schedule. It's not a particularly challenging high major slate. Seton Hall is always challenging. It's a rival. Uh, we'll see. Roster development is still going on. But they're, they're not going to be projected as a top half Big East team going into next year. They're going to be in the bottom half projected-wise. Anything can happen, you know, and I think Shaheen Holloway is a very good coach. It is a road game, so that will help, but that could very, very likely be a quad to uh, road game, most likely. Then you travel to Wake Forest. Wake Forest, you know, is, is working the portal, and we'll see what how they finish out. But, um, you know, I think they'll be, and the ACC is not particularly strong, but I think they have, a, you know, a chance to be a top half ACC team. But that's probably going to be a quad to road game as well. Again, Road wins are huge, no matter what the quad. But those two high major road games likely to be quad two. And then you host Georgetown. That's probably going to be a quad three game. It's never too early to think about the net. So while that is three majors on the high majors on the schedule, and they could end up being quad one games or quality quad two games, I think, you know, Wake and Seton Hall could be for sure. Georgetown, you know, Ed Cooley, he's rebuilding. 
they're they're definitely. I mean, they're going to be below Seton Hall in terms of projected going into the season. They they could definitely be a, a last place team. You know, there's the Paul as well, but uh, not a not a super strong three high majors when you put them together collectively. Rutgers is definitely working on trying to find a, a neutral court game against another high major. I think that that's you know a must at this point. They're not going to be playing any feast week tournaments. They do have an MTE uh, where they're working on was a multi team event. Uh, they've done that a few times now in recent years. You know where they host uh, two or three home games and it's kind of a series where uh, the same four teams all play each other uh, at, at different different sites. But those would be probably low majors. There might be a mid major mix, and we'll see. But uh, they need they need at least I would say at least one neutral court high major opponent. Ideally, you know, eleven non conference games. I'd love to see them book too. And whether that's a home and home or a neutral court game, uh, aside from another neutral court game, you know, I look back the last few years. Rutgers has only played three high majors in non conference play. They haven't played four, they, but they have played a mid major. You know, whether it was Temple, UMass, again, not particularly strong men majors, but you need something there. And I know people are disappointed they're not going to play a Feast Week tournament. I think if Michael does want to make a statement, I think playing at least four high majors, four, I mean, I think four should be standard, to be honest with you. I think four in a really good mid major or five high majors. And again, maybe they have three kind of so, so high major games. Well, one bad high major game, Georgetown at home. And I'm not saying, you know, we'll see what Rutgers shakes out. The roster's still working, but Georgetown's not going to be projected a very good team going into the season. Maybe they add two high major games, but neither against like a top half, you know, high major conference team. But you get five on the schedule, and most of them away from the rack. That would be, that would be a legitimate upgrade on the schedule, and I think it's a way to do it in a in a process that's not overwhelming in sense of, you know, he's not going from zero to sixty in terms of upgrading the schedule, increasing the level of difficulty. It would be more challenging, but it would be a lot better for the resume as well. So we'll see. But that is that, you know, I wrote about his to-do list over the weekend. That's a, that's a big one scheduling. And I think you have to get a fourth high major opponent, preferably on a neutral court, just to get that value. And I would love to see them schedule a fifth tough game, you know, whether that's a, against a high major or a quality mid-major, uh, whether it's a home-and-home, home, a two-year series, or just – I don't think Pico would schedule a straight road game at this point, um, knowing that he's got Wake and Seton Hall already. Um, but we'll see. We'll see. But I, I, I do have hope there. I do think a lot of low majors will be on the schedule. But if if, if Rutgers can front load the schedule with, with five respectable high major opponents or, like I said, one mid-major thrown in, but mostly Q2, hopefully you get a Q1 out of it, that would, that would be a benefit. That would be a positive. Now, I do think – you know, the one, it's funny, being on the bubble and getting snubbed. And, you know, there were some candidates like Arizona State, Pittsburgh, obviously Nevada, uh, which did not represent well in the NCAA tournament. All were well behind Rutgers in the net, but made the tournament Rutgers didn't. The one that irks me the most, believe it or not, is Providence. Because if you look at Providence's resume from last year, and I'm not trying to, you know, I mean, I am going back a little bit and and, and harping on something, but I, I'm doing this in relation to next year's schedule. Providence's non-conference schedule in terms of their wins, their best win was a one-point victory at home against Ryder last year, and that was the opening game of the season. And that, you know, for me, that was like, what is the NCAA tournament saying? I'm just pulling up their schedule right now. And coincidentally, Rutgers was 39 and Kempom uh, Providence is four. So they they had two quality non-conference opponents, Miami and TCU. They lost both by double digits. Their best non-conference win was against Ryder, who was 206th in Kempom. They beat him by one. They had six non-conference opponents, 300th or worse in Kempom. 
They beat Rhode Island, who was 255. Ryder was 206. Now, what they did have going in their favor is they owned Big East intra-conference wins over Creighton, who was 12. UConn, national champs, also number one. And Marquette at number 10. So they had three really, really good wins. No good non-conference wins. But they had no bad losses. They didn't have any bad losses. And for me, I, I uh, that's why when everybody said the, the selection committee was saying to Rutgers they have to upgrade their schedule, I, I mean, I want them to. And I think they will. And I think they will get that fourth high major opponent, hopefully a fifth. But I think that that's something you could – I think could be in Steve Peichel's head is the last two years that they had just won the games they were supposed to win. And then they kind of always get a, a marquee Big Ten win, if not more, typically more. That would give you probably a resume. Now, I do think the NCAA Tournament Selection Committee last year is a little bit of an outlier. I don't know if it's you could really take a lot of precedent from I think last year's committee was weird. And I don't know if kind of some of their decisions are going to turn into trends or messages. But I do think the message – people, I think, forget that if you just win the games you're supposed to – and, yes, if you don't schedule a challenging non-conference schedule, your margin for error is that much more thin. If you have more quality games on the non-conference schedule, you can lose one or two and still make it up. If you only have two and you lose both and then you have a bad loss, you're not in good shape. So I do think, like I said, Rutgers will add a fourth or fifth, uh, hopefully a high major opponent. But it goes back to Providence and the Ruck and Rutgers. The difference in the resume was that Rutgers lost some games they shouldn't have. And Providence didn't. And that was a big difference. So last thing I wanted to cover, we're one week out, May 24th. May 31st is the deadline for Cliff Omori and Paul Mulcahy to withdraw from the NBA draft. Sounds like Mulcahy ultimately will return. Still waiting officially to hear on that. Cliff, so I've been pretty vocal the whole time. A lot of people seem pretty positive or optimistic that he was definitely going to return after he didn't get the NBA combine. I did a whole episode on Cliff if you didn't see it from last week. And my stance has always been that I don't think he's, I, I, I think he's 50, 50, um, a, he signed with an agency, which I want to get to. And he does maintain his eligibility because they're certified by the NBA, but he represented well at the G league draft camp, elite camp. He did not get that combine invite, but I don't think that that rules him out. Do I think he's going to get drafted? Probably not. But I think that people are looking at it too black and white. Just because you don't get drafted nowadays doesn't mean it's not necessarily beneficial for you to still come out. You know, Ron Harper Jr., he gave up one last year. Last year, he didn't get drafted. He signed a two-way deal with Toronto Raptors. Played really well in the G League. Developed. Got some time in the NBA with the Raptors. Had, had a couple of good moments there. You know, he's geared up. He's set up for an even better year or two, and he's going to have a chance to make the Raptors flat out. He made good money in the G league, uh, six figures, high, you know, mid, mid six figures from what I'm told, which is <laughs> pretty good. Uh, so my point is, I think Cliff has some skill sets, some physical skills, you know, the wingspan is off the charts, 76 and a quarter, I think inches. That's freakish. We know his athleticism. He's raw. But he's younger too, not not for his age, but he's he's less experienced. He started playing younger. NBA scouts know this. He has the type of background in terms of his skill set, his physical skills, his potential that I think would not surprise me at all if they wanted to invest in him in a two-way deal. He plays mostly in the G League. Maybe he has a cup of coffee in the NBA, but they're invested in him for a year and they try to develop him and see what happens. He's at kind of that peak age right now, 21. You know, if he, if he comes back to Rutgers, he's going to be considered a little older next year. Believe it or not, the younger you are, the the, the better your value. Uh, you know, NIL is a challenge at Rutgers for him because he's an international student. So they are going overseas in August. He potentially can make NIL money overseas. But he can make, he can make some good money in the G League. If he gets enough teams interested or even giving him guarantees that they would sign him to a G League two or a two-way contract, after the draft, which is what Ron Harper did, Ron Harper Jr., 
I think that's something, honestly, he seriously has to consider. And remember, he is signed with an agent. What does that agent want him to do? They want him to go back to Rutgers and they don't get anything? Or are they going to tell him you take this deal and you get the two-way, you work your way up, you develop, you're going to be in the NBA the following year? Read the signs. Again, I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know what he's thinking. I don't know what his camp's thinking. But if you look at those signs, it would not surprise me at all if he ends up staying in the draft. Again, I don't think he'll get drafted, although it's possible. But it would not surprise me at all if Cliff stayed in the draft, signed a two-way deal with an NBA team, and ended up in the G League next year. I think the idea that people think you can't develop in the G League, it's it's ridiculous. It's all, you know, guys trying to make the, the NBA. <laughs> you know, it's all fringe NBA players trying to make it. You know, that's a higher level of competition than college. So we'll see what happens. Again, man, I'm, I'm not trying to – well, yesterday I said how people, you know, say I'm a pom-pom waving, uh, always a half-class full person. I'm, 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 I'm keeping it real. I don't think – that Cliff missing the combine means he's coming back. I think he could come back, but I don't think that it's set in stone. I think there's a real possibility he's going to stay in the draft based on just those factors. So we'll see what happens a week to go. Obviously, Rutgers is kind of on hold until he makes a decision. But this goes back to my faith in Pykele and the staff and using that portal and finding the right fits. If Cliff comes back, they're still going to try to find a big as a backup. If Cliff leaves, they're going to, you know, I think you, you, you target a starter. And there's some intriguing names out there. And I'm not going to talk about it yet because I don't want to speculate. I'm hoping Cliff comes back. But, you know, I wouldn't be um, shooting straight if I didn't say it. And I would just want to mention the report that was came out from Jonathan Wasserman. Uh, from uh, Bleacher Report, this is what he wrote in his article. He's an NBA draft uh, writer for Bleacher Report. And I quote, certain prospects who didn't make the NBA combine are receiving assurances about signing two-way contracts, whether they are picked or not. Keep an eye on Florida's Colin Castleton, USC's Drew Peterson, Rutgers' Cliff Omori, TCU's Emmanuel Miller, Illinois' Matthew Mayer, Alabama's Charles Badaiko, uh, who Cliff has been compared to uh, and are similar, and Detroit's Antoine Davis, elite camp standouts who weren't voted to move on to the combine. We'll see what happens. Appreciate you watching and listening, and I'll talk to you tomorrow.